Hello everyone, this is Giacomo speaking from ESON and welcome to the new event on of the Ipatia, Ipatia Colloquium series 2022. This is the second event of this new series. I would like to remind you that the full program is available online on the Ipatia pages. I, I just posted the link to the to the to the program on on the chat on YouTube. So the, very quickly, technically speaking, so you can join the, the meeting either by subscribing and you can register. Uh, if you go to to our uh, Ipatia web pages, you can you can find a, a form that you can fill and you can register so you can join us uh, via the Zoom meeting or you can also watch the the the, 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 the event live on YouTube when we live stream. Uh, the event every week. Uh, also, you can watch, of course, later because the, 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 the event will stay online. As a matter of fact, there is already uh, um, all the events of 2021 are also available online. So today uh, we have again two ex excellent and uh, early career astronomer that we are very happy to host. And uh, the two chair of the, so let me remind you, you can, uh, everyone, if we'll be allowed to make questions, attend the event, you can make questions either via uh, the chat uh, on YouTube, or you can, but if people are joining uh, on Zoom, they can also raise their hand and then they will be allowed by the, the chair to, to make questions themselves directly. Um, if you want, you can also use a form that is available on our uh, Ipatia pages. I, again, I, I put the, the, the link on the YouTube. That if you don't have a YouTube account or a Google account, you can still send your question using the form available online. And also please be reminded that we, every year, we publish the beautiful Ipatia, uh, you can see here, the Ipatia um, proceedings. There will be a, this is the proceeding of year 2021, which is available on, on from download. So please go and look at it. And you can also cite the papers. These are papers written by the speakers, so please, Go and read inside them, or oh, and th there will be a new release this year, of course, with the new speakers. With this, I think I'm gonna close, and uh, I give the word now to our the child today. We have a fellow, Jakub, and the student from ISO, Gemma. So thank you very much for helping us in in in, in sharing the sessions. And Jakub, I leave the word to you to start the event. Thank you very much. Have fun. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Giacomo. Uh, hi, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the second, second week of this uh, year's series of the Hepatia, Hepatia Colloquia, uh, which is a great platform for us to, to, to listen about the great research from some excellent early career researchers. Um, and today we have two talks. Um, let, me, let me briefly share the screen with the program for you. Um, oh, it disappeared. There you go. Uh, we have two talks for you today. Uh, the first talk will be from Dan Dinisahu uh, from the Swiss Bern University of Technology. And uh, Nandini is the postdoctoral researcher uh, in, the, in, the, in Melbourne, in Australia, and the Swiss Bern University of Technology. And there she also recently completed her PhD. So, congratulations. Um, now it is uh, it is 1 a.m. now in Melbourne, so huge thank you to Nandini for for being here at this time. Um, and the, and the second speaker of today will be Emma Beezer, um, who will who will be connecting from from the United States from Tucson in Texas. So speakers from all around the world. Um, now Nandini will talk to us in a minute uh, all about the morphology dependent black hole mass scaling relations. Uh, and uh, why don't you why don't you start start sharing your screen and Dini and we can yeah. go from there. Okay. Okay, it's looking good. We can see your screen. Like, uh... Uh, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you just fine. So anytime you feel like, just, just go ahead, thanks. Um, hello everyone, I am Nandini Sahu. Uh, I recently completed my PhD uh, from Swinburne University, Australia. And I'm currently working as a postdoctoral researcher with Professor Alistair Graham and his group. 
And I'm going to talk about uh, uh, my work that I did during my PhD on black hole mass scaling relations. So uh, let's just start it. Um, so uh, this is very exciting times to be talking about black holes because recently we saw how these invisibles look like. And in the coming decades, uh, with the help of uh, space-based uh, VLBI uh, modes, VLBI interferometry, we'll be able to see many of such distant uh, compact objects. And observations suggest that uh, black holes exist in a continuum of mass. Uh, starting from stellar mass black holes at the low mass end, which can have masses up to 100 solar masses, and supermassive black holes at the high mass end, and which can have masses between a million to a billion solar mass. And in between the two mass ranges lie intermediate mass black holes. And ideally, a galaxy may have thousands of stellar mass black holes, but it has only one uh, supermassive black hole at its uh, center. Uh, and ideally, uh, it, a galaxy may have hundreds of intermediate mass black holes. But surprisingly, these intermediate mass black holes, most of these are missing. But uh, last year, uh, in 2020, LIGO Virgo collaboration announced their first detection of intermediate mass black hole, which was a 142 solar mass black hole formed by merger of two stellar mass black holes. And apart from that, there are many studies which have already predicted many intermediate mass black hole candidates, which are waiting to be detected by upcoming next generation facilities, which will have multifold, um, very high spectral and special resolutions. So my work on black hole scaling relations is based upon a set of supermassive black holes. And currently the number of directly dynamically measured the supermassive black hole masses uh, are about 150. So uh, uh, almost all the galaxies in the universe are expected to have a black hole at their center. And these black holes are thought to co-evolve with the host galaxy. And the correlations that we observe between black hole mass and various host galaxy properties hold many insights into uh, this co-evolution as to whether this co-evolution is hierarchical, which is given through mergers, or there is a role of uh, galactic accretion plus agent feedback. In order to establish the black hole mass scaling relations, we collected the largest sample of directly measured supermassive black hole masses, which are dynamically measured using these primary methods. Uh, most of the masses, uh, black hole masses, uh, in our samples are in our sample are measured using uh, stellar and gas dynamical modeling and mega measured kinematics. And proper motion has been used uh, to measure the black hole mass of uh, Sagittarius A at the center of our own galaxy. And uh, direct imaging has been used to confirm the black hole mass of uh, at the center of M87. So we calculated various uh, host galaxy properties and studied the correlation between black hole mass and these host galaxy properties. For example, bulge, or also known as spheroid stellar mass, total galaxy stellar mass, and some structural properties of the bulge, for example, its effective size, central light concentration, density of the bulge at various radii, and central stellar velocity dispersion. So uh, in this talk, I won't be able to talk about all these correlations and uh, feel free to ask me or check out my papers if I miss uh, some of these scaling relations. So before I move on to talking about how we extracted the bulge mass and bulge properties from the total galaxy, um, uh, I want to mention why these black hole scaling relations are important. Uh, first of all, the, as I mentioned before, uh, these black hole scaling relations can form tests for simulations and theoretical studies which are trying to understand the correlation, the co-evolution of black hole with the host galaxy. Uh, these scaling relations can be directly used to predict black hole masses in other galaxies where for now it is difficult to resolve the sphere of influence of the black hole and it is difficult to measure the black hole mass directly. Uh, black hole scaling relations are 
used to calibrate the virial factor, which is used to convert the virial product into virial mass for agents for the reverberation mapping of agents. And uh, black hole scaling relations are also used to form the black hole mass function of, an, of the universe, which is a very uh, important tool for cosmologists. And interestingly, uh, these scaling relations also play a role in predicting the detection of long wavelength, uh, microhertz to nanohertz gravitational waves, which are generated by the merger of supermassive black holes, and they are yet to be confidently detected by pulsar timing arrays and in future by LISA. Now, uh, I hope I have convinced you that yes, black hole mass scaling relations are important. So let's talk about my work. So we used a sample of about 130 uh, galaxies with directly measured black hole masses. And we obtained their host galaxy images. Most of the images in my sample are near infrared taken uh, by Switzer Space Telescope. Uh, after the basic reduction and uh, sky subtraction, we obtained the two-dimensional isophotal model of the galaxy. An example can be seen here. Uh, Left-hand panel is the galaxy image. Middle panel is the model, which uh, excellently mimics, mimics the galaxy. It captures all the photometric and structural properties of the galaxy. And the right-hand side uh, is the residual obtained by subtracting the model from the galaxy. Uh, we performed this process using a uh, in-house software called ISOFIT and C model, and these are actually publicly available on GitHub. So once we have the galaxy model, we identify various components which are present in the galaxy and disassemble the total galaxy light into its components. And to identify the components, we examine the galaxy image at, carrier, at various contrast levels and also use kinematic evidences to confirm for the presence of a rotating disk and or presence of a bar. So once we are sure about the components which are present in a galaxy, for example, bulge, a bar, or this, or ring, etc., we dis uh, perform this multi-component decomposition process uh, using some uh, functions, specific functions inbuilt in another in-house software called Profiler. For example, uh, we use CERSIC or core CERSIC function to uh, describe the surface brightness profile of bulges, uh, uh, some types of exponential function and few versions of exponential for different orientations of disk, Gaussian function for ring, et cetera. So uh, this, uh, after this multi-component decomposition, we have a uh, luminosity associated with each component of the galaxy and also some of the structural parameters which are captured by these specific functions. And, and we have luminosity associated with the total galaxy. Further, we use an appropriate mass to light ratio to convert luminosity associated with the bulge and luminosity associated with the total galaxy to convert it into uh, bulge stellar mass and the galaxy stellar mass. In our case, um, for our, uh, for our uh, 3.6 micron images, we follow a constant mass to light ratio of 0.6 for early type galaxies and 0.45 for late type galaxies, following the suggestion from mid atom uh, 2014. One important thing is that uh, this multi component decomposition process. Uh, apart from providing us the uh, precise measurement of bulge luminosity and structural properties of the bulge, which are captured using the CERSIC function, it provides us the detailed morphology of the galaxy. And various uh, galactic morphologies which are present in our sample can be seen in this morphology grid. So it can be classified into early type galaxies and late type galaxies. Early type galaxies comprise of uh, purely spheroidal elliptical galaxies or lenticular galaxies, which have bulge and large scale rotating disks. And we also have uh, ellicular galaxies, which have intermediate scale disks within their bulges. And late type galaxies comprise of all kinds of spiral galaxies, which have bulge disk and spiral arms. Now uh, let's jump on to the scaling relations that we observe. 
starting with the one of the most studied correlation between black hole mass and the bulge stellar mass. So here I'm showing um, on y-axis uh, black hole mass against the spheroid stellar mass on the x-axis. And here we found that early type galaxies and late type galaxies, the spiral galaxies, they seem to define two different relations with the uh, relation for late type galaxies being much uh, steeper than early type galaxies, uh, where early type galaxies have a near linear relation. However, uh, our further investigation suggested that this single relation for early type galaxies is misleading because uh, when we divide, divide these early type galaxies into early type galaxies which have a disk, that is illicular and lenticular galaxies, and early type galaxies without a disk, uh, the elliptical galaxies, we find that these two subpopulations of early type galaxies define two different relations which are steeper than the single relation for all early type galaxies. And importantly, there is an offset of more than an order of magnitude in the vertical direction. So um, this means that uh, if one wishes to predict black hole mass using the bulge mass, one should know whether or not the early type galaxies has a disk, uh, that is uh, whether it is elliptical or lenticular or illicular, and then use the corresponding relation to precisely predict the black hole mass. Interestingly, uh, this offset was also seen in a recent simulation by Marshall et al. 2020. This offset is very well understood. It is actually in the horizontal direction and it is reflected further in vertical direction because of non-zero slope of the relation. And it is because of a smaller bulges of uh, these early type galaxies, ellicular and lenticular galaxies, which also have a significant disk. And that is why when we further switch from just the bulge mass to total galaxy mass, uh, the offset between the two subsamples uh, reduces, suggesting a single relation for uh, all galaxy types between black hole mass and total galaxy mass. And however, the more important message here is that we find a correlation between black hole mass and total galaxy mass. That means, uh, one can estimate uh, predict black hole mass using directly using the galaxy stellar mass without needing uh, the bulge mass, which requires multi-component or bulge disk decomposition. Uh, in this diagram, I'm only showing the early type galaxies. And when we further add the late type galaxies here, we find that these uh, late type galaxies, the spirals, they follow a much steeper relation between black hole mass and galaxy mass with a slope which is twice as that of early type galaxies. Uh, in general, a uh, more than linear uh, relation suggests uh, between black hole mass and the stellar mass suggests that rate of growth of black hole mass is greater than the rate with which the host stellar mass is growing. And an even steeper relation for late type galaxies uh, may be uh, because of relative abundance of gas in the disks of these spiral galaxies, which are channeled at the center and gas is known to boost the black hole mass more than the uh, host stellar mass. Whereas uh, on the other hand, the early type galaxies are relatively gas poor. Now, so uh, in general, in the uh, black hole mass versus total galaxy stellar mass diagram, we find that early type galaxies and late type galaxies define two different relations. And in the black hole mass versus the spheroid mass diagram, there are three morphology dependent substructures the where elliptical galaxies, ellicular and lenticular galaxies, and spiral galaxies define uh, different trends. Uh, the uh, spheroid mass, uh, the mass, uh, the stellar mass of the spheroids uh, in our sample or in general, they depend on the luminosity enclosed by the uh, surface brightness profile of the bulges, which is known to very well describe uh, using a SERSIC function. And we use a SERSIC function to describe the bulge light profile. This uh, SERSIC function uh, is parameterized using these three properties. One is a SERSIC index, which is also known as the shape parameter of the profile and some example profiles are shown here. There is a scale uh, parameter, 
uh, scale radius, which is uh, in which in this case is the 50% uh, half light radius, which uh, marks the radius which encloses 50% of the total spheroid light. And further, we have surface brightness at RE, which is denoted by mu e. So mu e and RE are linked here. Uh, when we go deeper into investigating the correlation between black hole mass and structural various structural properties of the bulge, we find that the three substructures that we initially found in the black hole mass versus bulge mass relation reappears in the black hole mass versus uh, bulge effective size diagram. So here I'm showing on x-axis black hole mass against the bulge half-light radius, where initially Early type galaxies and late type galaxies seem to define different relation. And further investigation suggests that early type galaxies with a disk and early type galaxies without a disk, uh, the ellipticals, they follow two different relations which are offset by more than 10 times in the vertical direction. As uh, mu e, uh, the surface brightness at RE, uh, denoted by mu e, is linked with RE. Uh, we find the same substructure in the black hole mass versus uh, surface brightness at RE relation. While we do not see this offset between early type galaxy subpopulations in the black hole mass versus Celsic index relation. So we think that the offset between the two early type galaxy, sub galaxy subpopulations that we initially saw in the black hole mass versus bulge mass relation that is linked and originates uh, from the black hole mass versus size diagram. And it, this offset is uh, because of smaller bulge sizes of these ellicular and lenticular galaxies relative to that of elliptical galaxies hosting the same black hole mass. Um, we also investigated the correlation between black hole mass and um, bulge internal density at various radii and some of the important uh, relations are uh, presented in this paper, including uh, the correlation between black hole mass and internal bulge, uh, internal stellar mass density at half light radius, where as expected, uh, the substructuring due to late type galaxies and the early type galaxy subpopulations reappears. And we also present uh, an interesting uh, relation in this paper where we found a correlation between black hole mass and bulge density at the influence radius of the black hole. This uh, relation has very interesting applications. For example, this is useful in uh, predicting the characteristic strain of gravitational wave, uh, long wavelength gravitational waves. Um, I, of course, cannot talk about uh, that in more detail. So if you're interested, uh, you can check out uh, this paper, the uh, discussion section of this paper. Now, uh, using our appended uh, sample, we also reinvestigated the correlation of black hole mass and the central stellar velocity dispersion, where our central stellar velocity dispersion um, for our galaxies are already available in lit literature, and we got it from the Hyperlita database. So here we found that massive core Circe galaxies and Circe galaxies seem to define two different relations between black hole mass and central stellar velocity dispersion. And this break is actually consistent with a similar break found in the luminosity versus velocity dispersion diagram. And that has been seen in previous studies as well. Uh, now, what are these uh, Circe and core Circe classifications? Uh, this uh, classification is actually based on the central bulge light profile of these galaxies. So core Circe galaxies have a deficit of light at their center. So their bulge light profile is described using uh, an inner power law followed by a normal Circe function. Such a function is uh, known as a core Circe function and galaxies with a deficit of light are known as core Circe galaxies. Whereas Circe galaxies, um, which evolve through normal um, gas-rich processes, they do not have any such deficit of light. And why core Circe galaxies have a deficit of light is because these are those massive galaxies which evolve through dry gas-poor mergers. 
And during that merger process, when eventually their black holes come together, uh, during the, their coalescence, they kick out the stars from center and cause a deficit of light at the galactic core. And we think that uh, this uh, difference, um, this division in the black hole mass versus velocity dispersion diagram where core Cessic galaxies define a much steeper relation than the Cessic galaxies is linked with the uh, evolutionary tracks that these two type of galaxies follow. The core Cessic galaxies, uh, which evolve through dry mergers, uh, they add up during the dry merger, they add up their black holes, but they cannot keep the same pace for the velocity dispersion and end up defining an, a steeper relation relative to Cessic galaxies, which while increasing the black hole mass also significantly increase the velocity dispersion. Uh, interestingly, this uh, steeper relation for massive uh, galaxies, BCGs, uh, brightest center ga galaxies was initially first seen in Bogdan in 2018. And after this, uh, this division due to Cersic versus co galaxies in the black hole mass versus central stellar velocity dispersion diagram has been confirmed in uh, another paper, subsequent paper by Delu et al. 2021. So overall, there is a morphology dependent division in the black hole mass versus stellar velocity dispersion relation as well. So one should be mindful of galaxy morphology when using this relation to predict black hole mass or calibrate virial factor. This leads me to my uh, summary slide. Um, during uh, my PhD, I, I studied uh, many correlations of black hole mass with various host galaxy properties. And the recurring morphology dependent substructures in all this diagram uh, suggests that uh, in general morphology, um, black hole scaling relations are dependent on galaxy morphology, where uh, galaxy morphology itself depends on the initial formation physics and evolutionary tracks a galaxy has followed. Uh, which uh, one of these correlation is most fundamental that we could not conclude and something we are still working on and whether there is a uh, fundamental plane uh, where black hole mass correlates simultaneously with two different properties. Um, there are a few groups which have already explored uh, black hole fundamental plane. And in future, we will also explore this question using our appended sample and galaxy properties measured using the multi-component decomposition process. And we will also explore a morphology aware black hole fundamental plane. Um, now, these morphology-dependent scaling relations have many ramifications for their direct applications. For example, we can now have an improved morphology-aware black hole mass function. We can obtain morphology-aware virial factor for the reverberation mapping technique. Uh, we can improve tests for uh, simulations, which are trying to generate different types of galaxies, uh, which also have black holes at their center. And we can improve the predictions for the detectable amplitude and event rate for the long wavelength gravitational waves for pulsar timing arrays and uh, future space interferometers. So with this, I will now stop talking. Uh, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, thank you very much for this wonderful talk, Nandini. Um, a virtual applause to you. Um, and I now open the floor to, to the questions. Now we can ask the questions both uh, via Zoom uh, and also uh, in the chat and in the YouTube. Um, now we have the first question uh, from Paola, go ahead. Hello, hi Nandini, sir. Uh, the question, my question was related to the um, relation between the black hole masses and the uh, stellar bulges. I was uh, surprised by the error bars, which are much larger on the stellar masses uh, with respect to the black hole masses. I was naively thinking that it should be the other way around. So can you explain me how you determine the black hole masses or uh, error bars? So actually these error bars, uh, we also we have also noticed that and we have obtained the uh, direct, these directly measured black hole masses 
from literature, from the papers which use stellar dynamical modeling to directly measure the black hole mass. And we have simply adopted uh, their uh, error bars on the masses that they provide. So, and while on the other hand, for uh, the bulge masses that we have measured, we have generously assigned a higher error bar accounting for errors in decomposition and mass to light ratio and distance. So that is why error bars on the X, like, uh, sorry, spheroid mass are higher than the black hole mass. Uh, does that answer your, your question? Yeah, yeah, because at the end of the day, their determination of the slopes depends very strongly on how large yeah. the error bars are. So, okay, that was a, a word of caution. Yeah. Yeah, Thank so you. generally uh, in most of the scaling relations uh, for our um, the uh, properties that we measure, uh, for example, stellar masses or sizes, we uh, check the relationship uh, for a range of uh, uncertainties, uh, but we have not applied a range of uh, uncertainty on the black hole mass yet, but it is a good idea <laughs> to apply, uh, increase the error bars and check if the relationships are still consistent. But uh, that will still not change the morphological substructures that we see yes. in the scaling diagrams. Yeah. Sure, thanks. Um, we, have a, we have a question in the YouTube chat. The question is from Dimitri Gadotti. Uh, and Dimitri says, wonderful wor work, Nadindini. Um, and the question is, have you imposed a distance limit to your sample so that small bulges can be well resolved with Spitzer? since its PSF is not great? Yeah, actually, uh, no, because we do not have a very big sample and that will be uh, the correct uh, good thing to do, but uh, we only have a hand, like 130 galaxies with directly measured black hole masses. And in order to obtain a strong relation, we used all the uh, black hole masses which were directly measured. So we do not have, we have did not limit our sample to any distance or um, magnitude yet. But probably in future we will do when we have a bigger sample. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. Uh, I have a question myself actually. I was wondering if I could get you to speculate a little bit maybe. Um, and I was wondering if, if, if you expect or if you have any thoughts on how the, rela the scaling relations that you constrain uh, would propagate going into lower masses, maybe dwarf galaxies or intermediate mass black holes. What, what's your expectation there? So for now, when we have to predict uh, black hole mass of a dwarf galaxy, we do extrapolate the relation as it is, but that is not that may not be exactly correct. So uh, as of now, we have just one galaxy at low mass end, NGC 404, mm -hmm. and it does fall exactly on the extrapolation, but uh, that may be just a coincidence. Right. And for now, all we can do is just extrapolate and predict, but um, that may not be the real picture. So we'll know when we have the data. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. It is tempting to, to believe that one point, but indeed it's only one. Um, we have one more time for one more quick question and I see there is a question in the YouTube chat again from Dimitri Gadotti. Uh, he's asking uh, whether you've seen differences between bulges with low and high Celsius ind indices. Uh, sorry if I have missed it. Um, uh, can, can you repeat the question? Right, so have you seen differences uh, between bulges with low and high uh, Celsius in the indices? So, um, so we have uh, performed, for example, in general, uh, late type galaxies, the spiral galaxies have smaller bulges and they have smaller Celsius indices and the early type galaxies, which have bigger bulges, they have relatively higher Celsius indices. So uh, our scaling relation do predict different uh, trends between black hole mass and Celsius index for early type galaxies and late type galaxies. But um, the scatter in this diagram is quite high and the relation does not look very different. So, um, so even in our papers, we were not able to confidently conclude 
whether or not there is two different, there are two different black mass versus Celsius index relations for early type and late type galaxies. So um, for now, I, I don't think uh, there is, but there may be. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, thank you very much. Given the time, we have to move on. So let's thank Nandini again for this great talk. And um, okay. you can you can stop sharing your screen, I think. And I will give the floor now to uh, to Gemma, who will share the rest uh, of today. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jaro. Uh, thank you, Nandini, for the really nice talk. So the next speaker is Emma Bissor, and Emma got awarded her PhD about the projector the projectors of type 2 supernovae in Liverpool John Muir's University. And then she obtained a Hubble Fellowship. And now she's currently a fellow at the National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory. And today she's going to talk about the impact of realistic red supergiant mass loss on stellar evolution. So if you could share your screen and whenever you're ready. OK. Oh, uh, good morning. Thanks so much for coming to watch my talk. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, so as Gemma said, I will be talking about the impact of red supergiant mass loss. So to get started, there we go. Um, so red supergiants are evolved massive stars with initial masses anywhere between 8 to 25, 8 to 30 solar masses, depending on um, how you model it. Um, and they are the direct progenitors to type 2 supernovae. And the reason that this is uh, really cool is that they seeing which ones explode and which ones don't explode is a really powerful test of stellar evolutionary theory. So the red supergiants are really cool and really bright. So they're up here in the top right hand corner of the HR diagram. Um, famous examples include Betelgeuse and Antares. So for a standard 15 solar mass star, um, they spend most of their lives burning hydrogen in their core, um, but at some point they exhaust this hydrogen and they start burning helium in the core. And at this point, the envelope of the star swells up. So this is what makes the star look so luminous. It has this really huge extended envelope and it's cooling it down. And there's a lot of convection going on um, at this point. Um, so what this looks like on a HR diagram is that the stars leave the main sequence and evolve at basically a constant luminosity cooling down to the red supergiant phase. Um, so once they reach the, reach the red supergiant phase, they are on their way to the, their path to supernovas. So they're in their final evolutionary phase, we think, or maybe. Um, and basically in the core, um, the elements fuse to heavier and heavier elements until you eventually end up with a iron core. And at this point, there are no more nuclear reactions going on and the star collapses down and you end up with your core collapse supernovae. But the exact type of supernovae you see, um, it's not really like a trivial question because it depends very strongly on the appearance of the progenitor at core collapse and most crucially it depends on how much of its hydrogen envelope the star has managed to hold on to so the lifetime of red supergiant is about a million years and the mass loss time scale is about the same as this so you could technically peel away the whole envelope off through this lifetime depending on the mass loss um, so when is mass loss important? And it, the answer is when it's strong enough to remove the envelope of a massive star because this is when it's going to affect what type of supernova we see. Um, so for a standard red supergiant with normal mass loss, it leaves the main sequence, um, so less than 30 solar masses, evolves across where it reaches the red supergiant phase and it doesn't lose too much mass and it stays there and it will die as a type 2p supernovae, so it's held on to its hydrogen envelope. Um, so there's the 2p. Um, but there is another option that's been suggested. So people think that maybe um, the, these red supergiants in this mass range might have extreme mass loss during the red supergiant phase. So what this would look like would be the star would get to the red supergiant phase, but then it would experience high mass loss, enough to peel away a big chunk of the envelope, and the star would move back to the hot part of the red of, of the HR diagram and die as a strip type supernovae, but definitely not a type two. Um, so we don't know the exact type, we don't know really what it this would look like, but the people have suggested that enough mass can be lost that you die as a um, type one supernova rather than a type two. So 
Uh, just to show that another way, there are basically two options for the type of progenitor you could get. You could end up with a hot progenitor, for example, a wolf ray star. So this is one where the hydrogen envelope has been peeled away. Um, or you end up with a red or a yellow supergiant progenitor. So this is if it's managed to hold on to its hydrogen envelope, and that will produce a type 2 supernovae. Um, so what does stellar models say about this? These are the Geneva evolutionary models from 2000. Um, and here they predict that a 25 solar mass star will leave the main sequence, get to the red supergiant phase, and you can see it, see it stays there, the track ends there, so it will die as a type 2 supernovae. Um, but above this, the 40 solar mass star um, experiences a really short red supergiant phase, but comes back out and won't, won't die as a type 2. Um, but if we look at the next set of models from this group, we can see they look quite different. So this is still the Geneva group, but the models were updated in 2012. So now if we look at the 15 solar mass track, you can see that the star gets to the red supergiant phase and dies there. But the 20 solar mass star now only has a short red supergiant phase and comes right back out and dies as a type 1 supernovae. And this is quite a significant difference. It means that the, the upper mass limit to type 2 um, Progenitor, uh, type 2 supernovae progenitors is somewhere between 15 and 20 solar masses, which is quite a bit lower than the 30 solar masses previously predicted. But what's changed between these models? Um, so loads of things have changed because models get updated all the time as we learn more. But um, quite importantly, the way that mass loss rates were implemented changed quite drastically. So in evolutionary models, um, the mass loss rates are not calculated from first principles. So um, you have prescriptions for the hot phase that are purely empirical um, or semi-analytical. And then for the cool phase, you have a different set of prescriptions. So everything above 10,000 Kelvin, um, there's hot star mass loss, for example, the Vink prescription. And when you get to below um, 10,000 Kelvin, you swap to the cool supergiant mass loss. Um, so there's the Diagra and the Van Loon prescription, which I will talk more about in a bit. Um, but in these 2012 models, um, the additional uh, kicker here was that the any time the luminosity went five times above the Eddington luminosity, the mass loss rate was cranked up by a factor of three. And this kicked in at 20 solar masses. Um, and this like ramping up of the mass loss isn't informed by observations. It was um, just to help the models keep running without crashing. So as I said, the mass loss rates aren't calculated from first principles. So we rely on empirical mass loss relations in the cool supergiant phase. So for a given luminosity, you pick your prescription and then you read off a mass loss rate. And you can see that depending on which prescription you pick, you can end up with um, quite, a different, quite a different mass loss rate for a given luminosity. But most models use the Diaga prescription, which is this one I've highlighted in green. Um, so but even within this one mass loss rate prescription, there's a lot of internal scatter. So there's about a, a scatter of about plus minus a factor of 10. And just to put that into context for you, that plus minus factor of 10 could be the difference between a star losing none of its envelope or losing its entire envelope through the red supergiant phase. Um, and I've just got on, on this plot as well, I show some other um, observations of red supergiant mass loss rates. So you can see that the observational um, the observational groups of stars um, also are quite scattered around that Diaga prescription. Um, so this prescription wasn't so much a new study as it was a literature search. So the authors um, collected values for the mass loss rates of 271 stars across all spectral types, um, and they were all field stars. And this sample itself was highly heterogeneous. So because they were all field stars, there was no um, constraint on the masses or the metallicities of the stars, but it was also really heterogeneous in terms of the methodologies used to cal calculate the mass loss rates in each case. So some of the studies used uh, mid-infrared excesses, other ones used radio emission, but there was no, um, there was no uh, set way of calculating mass loss rate. They just collected every measurement they could find. And this prescription is no longer used for the hot stars. It's only really used for the cool stars. Um, so I think it's fair to say that it needed a bit of an update um, and there is a way to, um, to, to do this with, with, and reduce the, the errors from the, the potential errors from using a heterogeneous sample. Um, and the way to do this is to target red supergiants in clusters. So if you look at stars, the red supergiants in clusters, you can assume 
that all of the red supergiants are the same metallicity and the same initial mass. Um, and this is because the red supergiant phase is so short. That if you're seeing a star as a red supergiant phase, uh, as a red supergiant, um, then you can assume that they're all the same initial mass to, with about, to within about 0.1 solar masses. Um, and this means that we can also use luminosity as a proxy for the evolution. So the lower luminosity um, red supergiants are the ones that have just arrived to the red supergiant phase. And then as they get brighter, it's as if you're seeing um, the red supergiant evolve towards supernovae. Um, and if we look at the figure on the bottom left, so this is NGC 2100. So everything bright and red there is a red supergiant. So there's about 19 red supergiants in there. And just for more context in the Diaga prescription, um, out of the whole prescription, there were only 15 or so red supergiants. So in this one cluster, we already have a, a larger sample. Um, so this work relied on mid-infrared data. So we used some archival data from WISE, Spitzer, and MSX, but we also used data from the Sophia telescope and the forecast instrument. Um, so how do we measure mass loss rates? So the red supergiants emit their light, um, and because of their mass loss, they're surrounded by this dust layer that absorbs and re-emits photons, and we can mo uh, model the mass loss um, using um, using this mid-infrared excess. So what the, here's a little cartoon of what that looks like. So the red line shows the SED of the star before its light has been processed through the dust, and then the blue line shows um, what we actually end up seeing. So light gets absorbed here in sort of the optical regime, and then it's re-emitted down here. Um, and for red supergiants, we see this really characteristic um, silicate bump. So it's it's a 10 micron bump, but it's because of all the silicate rich dust in the, in the dust shell. So here's what it looks like with real data. So we take the mid-infrared data and we fit it to radiative transfer um, models. So in this case, I used the dusty models. Um, and with, with this data and the models, we make some assumptions, for example, about the grain size distribution, about the gas to dust ratio, um, and we can derive a mass loss rate for each red supergiant in the cluster. Um, but we don't just wanna know what, what mass loss is like for one cluster, because then we're only focusing on one initial mass. We wanna see how mass loss rates change with the initial masses of the stars. So we look at a few different clusters. So these are um, galactic and LMC clusters. So, uh, Kuiper and RSGC1 and NGC7419 are all um, galactic and the other two are LMC clusters. But by looking at clusters of different ages, we're targeting red supergiants of different initial masses. So for each star in the cluster, we calculate a mass loss rate under luminosity. So we've got luminosity along the x-axis there and mass loss rate along the y. And what we found was that um, in each cluster, the slope of the mass loss rate luminosity relation was pretty much the same. So we've just fixed that, um, fixed that here for this. Um, and what we also found was that the offset of the relation um, increased with, in, with initial mass. So these three clusters here are all around 15, the initial masses are around 15 solar masses. Um, and for RSGC1, the red supergiants are a higher mass. They're 25-ish solar masses. So you can see that it's a really clear um, trend with increasing initial mass. Um, so this is really cool. So we decided to compare this to the Diaga prescription, um, which is the one that's most commonly used in models. Um, so we found that our prescription had a slightly smaller, smaller RMS. Um, and obviously there's no offset here um, between our stars. So we've just simply taken the residuals of what we would predict with our prescription and what we actually measured for each star. Um, and then if we look at the Diaga prescription, the scatter is slightly higher and there's an average offset. So they're gonna be slightly over predicting um, the mass loss rate for most of the stars. But the thing to look out for is the highest mass and the highest luminosity stars. So the red supergiants over here. Um, so the offset here is about 1.4. So they're gonna be, this prescription is gonna massively over predict the mass loss rates for the highest luminosity and the highest mass stars. And this is important because these are the ones who, uh, these are the stars that may or may not evolve away from the red supergiant phase, um, depending on the mass loss rate that we that, that it's undergoing. 
So it's important that we know what's going on for the highest luminosity stars. So if we just compare this to um, the Geneva models, so uh, we have time after leaving the main sequence on the x-axis and current mass on the y. So in the Geneva models, the 2012 ones, they predict that a 20 solar mass star will lose about 10 solar masses of material um, during the red supergiant phase. And this is what's forcing the star back to the blue. Whereas with our prescription, we find that it would only lose about one solar mass of material. Um, so this is not enough to remove the hydrogen envelope. And um, with our prescription, we wouldn't be seeing these stars um, moving back to the blue. But this was just a back of the envelope kind of calculation. Um, we've also put our prescription into the MESA revolutionary code. Um, so this is what we found. We performed a comparative study to the MIST set of isochrones. So the MIST isochrones used the, used the Diaga prescription. Um, they didn't have this factor of three increase. They just used it as it was. Um, and we just simply changed the mass loss rate to our prescription. Um, so nothing else in the models has changed. Um, and what you can see is that there's not really a change in the endpoint of stellar evolution. So they all sort of pretty much die in the same place that they would in the MIST models. Um, so looking at these models, um, you would you would say that none of these stars are going to evolve away from the red supergiant phase. Um, so there's not going to be a single star pathway here for producing wolf rays or strip type supernovae because all of these stars are going to stay in the red supergiant phase. Um, but so while the final luminosity and final HR diagram position didn't change, um, something did change and that was the final versus the initial mass relation. So um, here Dutch is the uh, prescription implemented by Mesa and the, the Dutch and Bezor is when we've just changed the cool supergiant mass loss um, to ours. So the pink squares you can see are from our prescription and they pretty much follow the one-to-one -one line. So you see a positive correlation between the initial mass and the final mass. Whereas with the Dutch models, you see this kind of plateau. Um, and that is because as I showed earlier, the Diaga prescription over predicts mass loss rate for the highest luminosity and hence the highest mass, highest initial mass stars um, by the most significant factor. Um, and this may seem really obvious, but if you turn down the mass loss rates, you end up with a higher hydrogen envelope mass at core collapse. So again, um, the Diagra prescription, you see this sort of plateau. They basically have um, almost a constant um, hydrogen envelope mass at core collapse. So no matter the initial mass of the star, um, you don't see an envelope mass higher than about eight solar masses. Whereas with our prescription, we see again a positive correlation between the initial mass and the hydrogen envelope mass at core collapse. Um, and this sort of uh, opens an interesting door since this hasn't been uh, predicted before. Um, could this, uh, this correlation between initial mass and hydrogen envelope mass um, be used as a method of determining initial mass? So for example, if there's a signature of these higher envelope masses in a supernova light curve, we might be able to, to see that um, and uh, use that as a method of getting the initial mass of the star. Um, so there's a chance, uh, something that always people always say to me is that there might be high mass loss phases prior to supernovae. Um, and one issue with this is that it, it could happen, but if the star lost a lot of mass in a really, really short amount of time, the, the mass wouldn't have time to move away from the star. It would sit really close to the progenitor when it exploded. Um, and you would see probably a type, um, a different type of supernova, perhaps a 2N. You would see lots of narrow lines as the, as the shock of the supernova moved through um, this, this envelope. So again, like another thing I get asked a lot is about what about high mass loss phases? So these mass loss rates um, aren't exactly, aren't instantaneous. So the warm dust that we're measuring with the mid infrared data is sensitive to within about 10, uh, tens, of sol uh, tens of stellar radii. So it's like the last hundred years or so. Um, but if, the, if any high mass loss phase or super Eddington phase was important, it would have to last um, like 10 to the five years to remove around 10 solar masses of material. So to remove enough mass 
to um to get the star to go back to the to the blue uh, it would have to last a really long time so you would expect to see around 10 percent of red supergiants undergoing mass loss rates higher than about 10 to the minus four solar masses per year so about a factor of 10 higher than um the mass loss rates that we see in the quiescent days um so the stars that are thought to represent this are the the dust and shrouded red supergiants so those were first identified by um well identified in the van loon paper um so they're these stars up here so you can see they're quite bright and they have higher mass loss rates um and this has been used to um form a prescription for dusty phases so this is three of the clusters the three with the same initial mass um and this is what the diaga prescription looks like and you can see that the van loon prescription so based off these dust and shrouded stars sits quite a lot higher um than what we actually observe but if the but a way of um seeing if this phase is important is to uh define what a dust and shrouded red supergiant should look like and then go and look for them so for a dust a dust and shrouded red supergiant to be um to be important it needs to be undergoing a mass loss rate of um of log m to the minus four so again about a factor of 10 higher so you would see a significant loss in light um in the loss of flux in sort of the optical and you'd see a huge mid infrared excess over here so this would be indicative of a very high mass loss rate um and if we look in the lmc we can see how many red supergiants look like this or how many stars look like this um, and what we find is that only one um, object sits in the uh, in the in this high mass loss rate phase that would be high enough to make a difference to the evolution. So it's nowhere near ten percent of the population. Um, so WOH G six four is also a bit of a known weird object. So it's got a really crazy structure, um, and the ob the points highlighted in red here are those that were included in the um, Van Loon prescription. And you can see they don't sit out as like a distinct group. They're kind of scattered all through um, the, the population of the LMC. Um, so yeah, so again, that's just a, a very odd star, but there's only one. So yeah, so what we can say from this is if the Van Loon sample isn't standing out as a unique group, there's not really a reason to use the Van Loon prescription um, unless you're sort of testing what kind of highest, the highest mass loss rate um, prescription can do to a star. Um, and just to show that another way, if we look in um, at the extinctions of the stars, so for a dust and shrouded red supergiant, you'd expect the circumstellar extinction, so from that huge dust, cloud, the dust shell, um, to be around two uh, magnitudes in the V-band. And we only see um, two stars above this. So there's WOH G64, which you can see is absolutely miles away from everything else. Um, and this one object here, LILMC4, which is actually more likely an AGB star. It's sort of just on the cusp. Um, so I think I'm running out of time. But what this all means is that um, if you look at the population of stars, the observed hydrogen poor supernova fraction um, is around a third of all the supernova that we see. And the stars between 8 to 30 solar masses are around 85%, and stars above 15 solar masses, uh, above 30 solar masses, are only around 15%. Um, so there's a big uh, discrepancy between the progenitor population and what we see in supernovae. Um, and if mass loss rates were higher, you could explain this because these red supergiants would move away from the red supergiant phase and they would die as hydrogen poor supernovae, but it actually goes the other way. And what this means is that um, the single star evolution cannot explain the observed supernova rate. And this is quite strong evidence for most of the hydrogen poor supernovae being the products of binary interaction. So I will just leave my conclusions up here and I'm happy to take any questions. So thanks so much for listening. Thanks, Emma. That was really, really nice. So while you were having the talk, we already got some questions. Claudia is asking, what are the shortcomings of using Dusty to derive the mass loss rate? Um, 
Yeah, so you do have to make some assumptions. Um, so I guess that's like the one of the bigger downsides. But um, I mean, you have to do that in anything. The advantage of using the mid infrared excesses versus like using the like radio emission from ALMA is that the corrections from like the gas to dust ratio are lower. You don't have to scale things up quite so much. Um, but there are, you know, some assumptions we have to make that, you know, might that are hard to like sort of check really, really detailed. So the gas to dust ratio is something that's quite fiddly. Um, but as long as the um, the gas to dust ratio isn't actually like a factor of like 100 higher than what we predict, it's not really going to make a difference to the results. So dusty is a pretty solid way of getting mass loss rates. And there's another question from Paul that actually I was wondering myself. So might low mass loss rate of massive um, LMC supergiants be linked to reduce metallicity versus Milky Way counterparts, different dust properties? Yeah, so we found, sorry, if you can hear a background noise, it's because there's leaf blowers outside. Um, so we found that there's not too much of a difference between the LMC mass loss rates and the Milky Way mass loss rates, we don't actually think that metallicity has a huge effect on it because you already take into account um, the metallicity when you when you um, when you put in your gas to dust ratio. So the LMC is a different gas to dust ratio than than the Milky Way. So we kind of count for it there. Okay, there's also another question, but I'm gonna let the the people from the Zoom also asked. There's one question from Dietrich Bader. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very, very nice, very clear talk. Um, you have emphasized many times that uh, what you've studied is a quiescent uh, mass loss, mm -hmm. uh, but many stars in the mass range uh, will be will go through a LBV phase, uh, phase of a luminous blue vari variability. Uh, how would that or could that change the picture? Or do you declare all LBVs as binaries? Um, I. Yeah, so I think the evidence for LBVs being binaries is pretty strong when you look at, for example, the separations from, you know, the O-type stars, they're, they're quite separated, which implies, you know, older ages. Um, so I think they probably are from, evolved from the binary route. Um, like most stars above 30 solar masses are going to be in binaries just because the binary fraction creeps up. But in this kind of mass range, the red supergiants that we see are probably all single and if they were undergoing a, um, they would have to undergo like a high mass loss phase in the red supergiant phase to come out to become LBVs. Okay, thank you. So there's also a comment from Joe Anderson that says, I think those progenitors in your new models with hydrogen envelope masses greater than 15, 15 solar masses would we'll have very long plateau phases, which I don't think we have observed. So either these don't explode, the red collapse to black hole, or as you say, they do, but they have some extreme mass loss at the end of their lives and explode as, for example, to type 2 n Yeah, so this is something that um, I'm gonna be looking into very soon. So the next phase will be to explode these models, see what they would look like, um, see what any degeneracies are, um, see how, um, you know, what are the ways that you would be able to like hide this, the higher envelope mass. Um, so I'm, I'm looking into it, but yeah, that's a good point. Okay, thanks. Um, so there's another question from Jakob. Um, right, uh, thanks for a nice talk, Emma. Um, I have a question about the upper, uh, the empirical uh, upper luminosity limit of red supergiants mm -hmm. and whether this is something that your mass loss rates um, um, calibration naturally reproduces or do you need some other type of mass loss to, to, uh, to do that? Um, so as I, sh let me see if I can get the figure up. Oh, okay, my mouse has stopped working. Um, as I showed, let me 
isn't it? In this figure, changing the mass loss rates actually doesn't really affect the um, the final luminosities of the of the of the stars in the models. Um, the empirical upper luminosity limit is about five point five. Um, when you when you look in the um, in the Milky well not in the Milky Way in the, the LMC the SMC and in M thirty one which is about Milky Way metallicity. Um, but there are a lot of things in the models that can sort of turn up or down the the um, the HD limit. So it's kind of hard to do it just from the models. And um, but the mass loss rate shouldn't really affect the final luminosity in this in this mass range. Okay. And have you perhaps tested uh, somewhat more luminous ones, like five point eight or so for these lower masses models or? Yeah, I'm in. I'm currently like doing that right now. I actually have some maser models running of some higher mass stars. So TBD. <laughs> Fingers crossed that the models converge nicely. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. There's no more questions. So thanks, Emma, again for this really nice talk. And well, thank you everyone for being here to that today. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. So Gemma, I can jump in just to close. Uh, thank you, Gemma. Thank you, Jakub, for the for the great uh, for chairing the sessions and and let me congratulate again with Emma and Andini for the nice talk. And I would just remind to everyone, please go to our web pages as the, 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 you can download from our page the CVs of the speakers. And so you can have a look and you met them more closely. Uh, actually, I guess Nandini, you can now uh, see, we can thank you for being awake so late. <laughs> so you can now take a deserved rest. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Nandini, again. Congratulations. Thank and thank you everyone for joining, for making the questions and, and please, See you, follow us again next time on next Tuesday. Uh, see you soon then. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.